Hi, this is Natalie Hoffman of FlyingFreeNow.com, and you're listening to the Flying Free Podcast, a support resource for women of faith looking for hope and healing from hidden emotional and spiritual abuse. Welcome to episode 237 of the Flying Free Podcast. Last week, I gave you a sneak peek into part one of my upcoming book, and this week, I'm going to give you a sneak peek into part two. Now, keep in mind that this is the vomit draft, and the final version may or may not look like this, but I wanted to share a little bit of the creative process with you just for fun, and also to get you excited to read the whole thing when it comes out next year. So today, I'm going to read the introduction to part two. And then I'm going to read two, I've selected two of the 20 mini chapters that are in this part. I've selected chapter six and chapter 15 to share with you. So here we go. Introduction to part two. Prayer pleading. Oh, take my heart, my Savior, move its inward springs for me. Thy life in my behavior springs in action constantly. Oh, my Savior, I am mourning for a living touch from Thee. Let Thy Spirit's pure adorning mold my character in me. Oh, do hear me. Oh, do hear me. Else I think my heart will break in the longing. Be Thou near me and my burning thirst. Oh, slake. Oh, Lord Jesus, hear my crying for a consecrated life. For I bite the dust in trying for release from this dark strife. Desperately biting the dust in an effort to please God by living a consecrated life perfectly describes the next phase of my life. When I read through the journals I kept, journals full of Bible verses and quotes from godly woman books, Puritan books, books by John Piper, Elizabeth Prentice, Watchman Nee, Fenelon, Eon Thomas, Oswald Chambers, Amy Carmichael, and dozens of others, I see a single thread of anguished longing to be whatever God wanted me to be, alongside a panicked fear of failing in that mission. In my mind, it all seemed so clear, but in the reality of my life, everything dissolved into a confusing type of craziness. I often felt like I was Alice in Wonderland, where nothing was as it seemed, and I couldn't figure out the patterns or the keys I needed to unlock the truth and be free. In recent years, I've learned about and applied internal family systems, a way of looking at ourselves that recognizes we have different parts inside, and those parts each have their own beliefs or programming based on our history of experiences. Some parts of us, called manager parts, try to prevent pain by working hard to manage the circumstances and people in our lives. They might do this by trying to please people, control people, manage other people's emotions, judge people, and so on. These parts of us might think, for example, that if only we could make people like us or do what we need them to do, we will be happy and avoid pain. Other parts of us, called firefighter parts, spring into action if our manager parts were unsuccessful at preventing the pain. These firefighter parts of us attempt to put out the fire of the pain to make it go away. They may do this by overeating, overdrinking, overspending, self-harming, or drug abuse. These parts of us believe that immediate relief is the answer, and we must do whatever it takes to make the pain go away. They don't understand that some of the methods we use to get immediate relief often lead to long-term damage. When trying to explain all of this to my own children, I thought of an analogy that uses what IFS teaches and explains it in an easy-to-understand way. Imagine your life is a bus. In the front of our bus is our self, and we drive the bus through life wherever we want to go. The self is interconnected with God and is whole, complete, and resourced. God didn't put our self in charge of anyone else's bus, just our own. So we are the driver unified and at one with our Creator God. But there are other parts of us on the bus too. Sitting on one side of the bus are our manager parts with all of their ideas and thoughts about how to manage our lives in order to prevent pain. On the other side of our bus are all of our firefighter parts ready to spring into action as soon as we feel negative emotions. Way in the back of the bus are our exiled parts. 
I think of them as being younger versions of us curled up in the fetal position in the far back seats of the bus where they can hide and let life pass them by without getting involved. These are the parts of us that carry all of our pain and past trauma and confusion. Some examples of ways that we acquire exiles include being bullied in school, getting lost in a shopping mall, losing a friend in an accident, going through a natural disaster, witnessing a traumatic event, having a hard time finding friends, growing up poor, growing up in an overly strict home, having a parent with a mental health issue or substance abuse problem. These parts sometimes disagree with one another about the best course of action. They judge each other. They fight. Sometimes when I'm feeling particularly chaotic in my body, I will think, oh, I get it. My parts are having a food fight right now. And I will want to slow it down, tune in, and listen to what individual parts are trying to communicate to me. I'm not listening to something outside of myself. I'm listening to my own beliefs and inner thoughts. If I don't stop to listen, I will never know what's going on inside of me. I will never have the self-awareness I need to address the issues I'm struggling with. Because guess what? These parts also need an empathetic witness to heal and find peace and calm in our body. And we are that empathetic witness for ourselves. The beautiful, miraculous thing is that God within us partners with us in our core self to be that empathetic witness. Richard Schwartz, the founder of IFS, teaches that when we are attuned to our core self, we will experience the eight C's, compassion, curiosity, calmness, clarity, courage, connectedness, confidence, and creativity. In her book, All Together You, Jenna Ramirsma makes the connection between these eight C's and the fruits of the Holy Spirit found in Galatians 5, and 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, kindness, and self-control. When we are aligned with the Holy Spirit within us, we will experience these qualities. So think about how life-giving it would be to have someone who is compassionate and curious, calm, clear, courageous, connected, confident, and creative interacting with us when we are scared, angry, frustrated, overwhelmed, sorrowful, or worried. What if we do have that someone within us? What if the only thing keeping us from actually experiencing that someone is our own lack of belief that this empathetic witness is already there? Jenna says it's kind of like the fact that the sun exists, but we can't experience it when the clouds are in the way. I also use a CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, tool that helps women look at their thoughts and beliefs to discover how they make her feel in her body and how those feelings cause her to show up in her life. So if you put the ideas of IFS together with this cognitive behavior therapy model, it might look like allowing one of our parts to come up to the front of our bus and tell us what they're thinking. There is something wrong with me, they might say. When this part believes that thought, we feel shame in our body. When we feel shame in our body, we might Hide, cover up, pretend, shut down, play small, be indecisive, refuse to take risks, and so on. And when we do these things, it ends up confirming in our mind that, yes, there truly is something wrong with us. So we prove to ourselves what a part of us believes. And this creates a never-ending loop that we can't escape unless we interrupt it at the thought line, unless we examine the belief within us causing the trouble. What happens when we share something important or scary or confusing with someone and they listen, empathize, and care? We feel heard. We heal just a little bit. They are an empathetic witness, and this is what helps us process the trauma of not being heard or seen or understood. So what can we do for these frightened, confused, and panicked parts inside of us is offer to listen, hear, and understand where they are coming from. I can understand why you would think that way, precious part of me. You were told there was something wrong with you over and over by different people in your life. No wonder you are worried it is true. 
I am so sorry people told you those things. The truth is that there is nothing wrong with you. You are a human being with totally normal reactions and responses to the kinds of things you have experienced. I am here to listen and love and support you from now on. I promise to always have your back. Together, we will find hope and peace and love and healing. This is a very simple example, and working through the quagmire of all our programmed thoughts and beliefs is not an overnight fix. I've been doing this work for many years now, and I anticipate doing it until I die. It is the ongoing work of being a healthy human, not a perfect human, but an honest, authentic human. It means accepting that we have parts inside that have dark impulses And those parts are trying to protect and help us, even though their ideas of how to do that may be misguided and destructive. If we want to neutralize some of the negative effects their beliefs have on our lives, we will need to allow them and befriend them. We will need to love all of our parts in order to heal. The incredible thing is that when we do this work, we are able to then offer this kind of love to others around us. Whenever I am triggered by someone else's behavior or words, that is my signal that a part inside of me is activated and needs to be heard and cared for. I won't be able to effectively listen and understand another person until I can listen and understand myself. This is a lot, I know, and if you want to learn more about this, I highly recommend Richard Schwartz's book, No Bad Parts, If you would like an incredibly insightful Christian perspective on this work, then Altogether You by Jenna Ramirzma is my recommendation. I read between 40 and 50 books a year, and Altogether You was my top pick for 2022. Life-changing. So what does all of this have to do with part two? Well, I'm going to do something a little different and let six of my parts tell this part of my story. You're going to meet rude, freaked, melancholy, wonder, spiritualizer, which is a name coined by Jenna in her book, Altogether You, and sweet little Rosie. Before we get started, I want to say one more thing. As a child, I had no control over my programming. Neither did you. We were programmed by our environment, parents, siblings, teachers, peers, churches, and experiences. We had no choice about what was planted in our minds. But as we enter into adulthood, we do have choices about what we will allow or not allow into our lives. But most of us will make those choices based on the programming we had no control over. In part two, you will see me making choices I look back on now and regret. I chose to continue in much of my early programming. You'll see bits and pieces of it in the quotes I include at the beginning of each chapter from the books I was reading at that time. On the one hand, I understand why I made those choices, and I have compassion on my young adult version of me. She did the best she could with the resources she had. On the other hand, if I want to heal and grow into the next version of myself, I need to take personal responsibility for my adult choices and the programming I choose to reinforce through my choices of friends, books, music, churches, and intentional experiences. If I don't take that kind of responsibility, then I will always blame my lack of growth and stuckness on outside forces, and that leaves me in a powerless position. I've chosen to take my power back, and that requires growing up, and being an adult who takes responsibility for myself. I can't blame my family, my ex, my kids, my church, my pastors, or anyone else for my own choices. But I also don't blame myself. Taking responsibility is not blaming. It's owning. And owning is something only adults can do. Then I'm getting ahead of myself. For now, Let's find out what some of my parts have to say about the years between 1994 and 2012. Chapter 5. Forks. 
I want thy plan, O God, for my life. May I be happy and contented, whether in the homeland or in the foreign field, whether married or alone, in happiness or sorrow, health or sickness, prosperity or adversity. I want thy plan, O God, for my life. I want it. Oh, I want it. Oswald Smith. Freaked. Is life just one big fork in the road? Sometimes it feels that way, and it's overwhelming and scary when I don't know which way is the right way and which way is the wrong way. Rosie. I know God set it all up so that I wouldn't even have to carry that burden of decision on my own shoulders. My husband is the head of our home, and I can bring all of these things to him, have him pray over them, and confirm them. Rude. The only problem is that John is more paralyzed than I am when it comes to forks in roads. So sometimes I just decide. For example, I recently decided to stop doing music ministry at church and focus on parenting and homeschooling. It was a unilateral decision, and I was pretty confident that it was God's right choice for me. So I didn't run it by John. Freaked. But now I have a nagging fear that I'm not being submissive. Then I found out John hasn't been paying our tithe. He says he hasn't paid it because we are struggling financially, but I believe we are struggling financially because he hasn't paid it. Rosie, I encouraged him to think about ways we could pay bills and still pay the tithe, and he came up with a plan to sell our computer. It brought in exactly the amount we needed to pay off the tithe money we owed to God. Freaked. I am relieved to have that debt paid off, but again, was I wearing the pants in our family by controlling that whole thing? I knew it was what God wanted, but should I have just let it go and waited to see what would happen without my input? I'm pretty sure the tithe would never have been paid, but how will I know if I don't trust God to speak to my husband? And then there's Y2K. John has been reading about this event, which is now less than two years away. I listen to the things he tells me, and I wonder if we are on the brink of a tribulation. I am afraid for my children. I don't want to watch them starve to death. I don't want to watch our son die of an asthma attack because we have no electricity. What if the mid-trib or the post-trib folks are right? Many innocent lambs have been martyred for the faith of their parents already. Why should my lambs be exempt? Why should we be protected from the consequences of mankind's pride and sin? I don't know what certain verses mean, or if I can hang my hat on them in a certain way or not, if only I knew the truth instead of just everyone's various debatable opinions. In the meantime, I make my plans for homeschooling and raising children, and I wonder, are my plans in vain? And what about having more children? Biblically, is there precedent for avoiding pregnancy? I didn't think there was, but now I'm scared. If we have another baby before Y2K, how will we get diapers or food or medicine? What if we have no heat? What if another depression hits? How will we provide for them? Rosie, I need to buckle up and trust that whatever God lays on John's heart, whatever John has peace about, that is God's plan for us. I will trust his perfect plan to lead our family through my husband. I need to think eternally and trust God completely. Freaked. Except that John originally told me he didn't want us to have any more children until Y2K is over, and I wasn't so sure that is a decision based on God's word. Rosie, I want to make decisions based on God's word, not my fears. But then, according to God's word, I'm supposed to submit to John's leadership. If he says, no more kids, then I need to submit willingly and trust that God will work out all the details. Rude. Why are we put in these impossible situations where if we do one thing, we are disobeying in one area, but if we do the other thing, we are disobeying in a different area? That makes zero sense. Freaked. I really don't know what is right and wrong at the end of the day. I'm not sure what scares me more, starving or freezing to death after Y2K, or getting to heaven and discovering I had it all wrong and God is disgusted with me. I guess the second one but I really, really don't want to experience the first one either. No matter which way you slice it, it's all a living nightmare. Rosie. And then, out of the blue, John said we could have another baby. I wasn't sure I heard right, but he insisted he felt God was leading us to try. Rude. 
And then a few days later, he changed his mind again. Which message from God did John misunderstand? Even so, I got pregnant a few months later from one night of unprotected sex at a marriage conference. John must have been right the first time when God told him we should try. I roll. Rosie, I believed it was a miracle. Freaked. Until I miscarried the baby. Rude. I guess John was right the second time when God told him we should not try. Another eye roll. Rosie, don't worry. God will give us more children. We just need to have faith. Freaked. I really wanted more children. Rude. So I take matters into my own hands again and convince John that adoption would be a good idea. Rosie, these babies already exist, so they will face the atrocities of Y2K regardless. Makes sense. And in fact, we find out about twin boys who need a family. Freaked. But we need to act quickly and start completing the adoption paperwork. Rude. John drags his feet as usual, and another family gets the babies. Rosie. I've noticed that the more I submit to John and do what pleases him and do not give him any feedback or disagree with him in any way, we have so much peace in our home. I've been actively practicing this for seven months now, and it has worked. Melancholy. But while I feel a sense of relief that he isn't mistreating me and calling me horrible things, I also feel like something died inside of me. And I know that deep inside me, It's a volcano of energy and heat building up and begging to be let free. I know it is there, and God knows it is there. The older I get, the more I see the scum inside me. It's disheartening, and I feel like my very soul is underneath the surface, boiling in the fires below. I like to think those fires are purifying me, burning off the dross so I can come forth as pure gold, but I also wonder if I am a zombie just pretending to be alive, making random decisions at forks in the road. But you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Psalm 10, 14. Have you ever asked any of these important questions? Why does my marriage hurt so bad, no matter how hard I try to make it better? Who am I anymore? And why do I have so much loneliness and self-hatred inside? What can I do to move forward in my life when I have felt stuck for so long? And where is God in the mess? I've been praying for years and I don't think he's listening anymore. If you're a Christian woman in a confusing and painful marriage who feels like you're spinning your wheels, looping on the same problems week after week, I'd like to help you change that. Six years ago, I developed a program that has helped thousands of Christian women wake up to their reality and live powerfully within it as the adult women God created them to be. The Flying Free program uses transformational coaching, workshops, classes, and a close-knit community of women to support you on your journey. I'm going to help you find answers to all of those questions, answers that make sense and align with your core values so that you can move forward. In 2023, I'll be reteaching all of my classes to reflect the ongoing training, education, and experience I've had working with thousands of survivors over the past six years. So it is a great time to join us. You can get all the details, including reviews, facts, and everything that comes with the program by going to joinflyingfree.com. And I'll see you on the inside. Chapter 15, Visionary Woman. Lord, I am thine, and I do yield myself entirely to you, and I believe that you do take me. I leave myself with you, work in me all the good pleasure of your will, and I will only lie still in your hands and trust you. Hannah Whittall Smith Melancholy What kind of woman am I? How do I want to define myself? I dislike so many things about myself. I have an insatiable, selfish desire to be loved, and I feel self-pity because I am not loved. 
I am forever looking for the approval of others. Freaked. I am terrified I will suffer because of the choices and behaviors of others. Spiritualizer. I am impatient and discouraged when I see laziness, apathy, unloving attitudes, lack of purpose, wasting time, and selfishness. Freaked. I fear all of these things will destroy our potential for God's glory, that my own life will have been for nothing. Melancholy. I gave up any influence in the world as a professor, writer, or ministry-focused leader in order to raise children and be someone's wife. I'm a nobody doing nothing of significance if my own kids grow up and just throw their lives away, and then my pain and sacrifice will have been for nothing. I had so hoped that one day I would be able to stand before God and say, here I am, and here are the ones you gave to me, all of them, all yours. Spiritualizer John Piper shared that the judgment seat of Christ for the believer will be like this. He will have a file on us of all our days, and most of those days will have F's and D's and C's on them. A few will have B's, and a very few might have an A. God will take the big stack of F's, D's, and C's and burn them. Then he will pick up the A's and B's and hold them up and cry out, Evidence of my grace! Evidence of my grace! Oh, I needed to hear that. Rude. So, wait a minute here. No grace for the C's, D's, and F's? Am I the only one who thinks this doesn't fit with what Jesus showed us? Rosie. I've decided I'm over trying to focus on my hopeless marriage. It is what it is, and nothing's going to change. So, I started a blog called Visionary Womanhood to encourage Christian women. I figure if my life as a Christian woman is confusing, painful, and tottering on the brink of being utterly meaningless, then maybe other women are feeling the same way, and I want to help. We need each other. After receiving permission from Bethlehem Baptist and having an elder put in charge, I have also been able to start a small gathering of homeschooling moms called Visionary Womanhood. We meet once a month and watch a video sermon from Vision Forum, an organization that is building up Christian families and helping parents raise the next generation of world leaders. One day, Christianity will rule the world with God's perfect law, and I want to do my part. I love to inspire Vision and the other women, and we spend a good deal of time praying for our husbands and children during the second half of the meeting. Spiritualizer I told the women that this is about a battle between God and Satan. Our posterity will either rise up and bless the name of the Lord, a people set apart as holy unto God our Creator, or our posterity will melt into the world and be lost. This is not a game. This is war. And here in this visionary woman at gathering, we are doing battle. Our work will not be in vain. This past week, I posted an article on my blog encouraging women to go to the Word of God for direction concerning the election, but I don't think very many women did that. They say they have no time, and yet I wonder if they have time to watch TV or read magazines or go shopping. Freaked. I don't know, and I feel bad for judging. It's just that it feels like such an uphill battle and God's side is losing. Will his church prevail? Is it doomed to slink toward Gomorrah until Christ returns? Will the church be triumphant or will she crash and burn and then be rescued at the last minute? I wish so bad I knew clearly what God was doing. Spiritualizer. Because Obama is our new president, our nation has ignored and rejected God. Freaked. Dear God, grant me faith to trust you when I don't understand. Spiritualizer. I also reposted a review on the Soul Surfer movie by Kevin Swanson. Christians are loving that movie because it's about a Christian, but it takes place at the beach. So there are a lot of half-naked women in this movie. Do we really want our sons and husbands to be looking at half-naked women? Melancholy. I got a lot of flack for sharing that review, and it was embarrassing. Spiritualizer. But someone must be willing to speak the truth. The lives of our children are at stake. 
One day at church, I saw a young woman with fishnet pantyhose and stiletto heels. Her fingernails were long and her skirt was short, and I felt a mixture of pity and animosity toward her. Didn't she know we don't dress like this in church? Will my boys or husband get turned on? How can I protect them? What does it feel like to look pretty like that? My nails were short and my skirt was long. At our family reunion last summer, my cousin's wife, who was the picture of sophisticated fashion, looked at me with amusement and said I looked like Ma Engels, straight out of a scene from Little House on the Prairie. I didn't even care. I laughed lightly and walked around our family reunion picnic that day and felt blessed with a baby and a sling on my back. Relatives were looking at me with curiosity, and I noticed one looking at me with open disgust, but I wasn't going to let their stares take away my joy. Rosie. I do so love my hilarious, clever, fun aunts, uncles, and cousins. I can hardly contain the joy I feel when I am with them. Melancholy. But this woman with the fishnet hose and stilettos sitting in front of my family and me? Did I love her? This feeling in my body was not love, but judgment. And while it was an uncomfortable feeling, I also didn't know what to do with it. We hadn't learned anything about that in our character booklets. Spiritualizer. I'm reading A Time of Departing, which is a book about how the New Age, mysticism, contemplative prayer movement is sweeping the Christian church. Very scary. Anyway, the author compared this kind of worship or practice, which has the appearance of being God centered and beautiful and good, to Cain's sacrifice. Cain thought he could please God by thinking up a better sacrifice, you know, less bloody, gross, and stinky. But God rejected his man wisdom offering. God is who God is, and he makes the rules, not the maggots he created. Someone recently asked me about whether or not we would encourage our daughters to go to college. I replied that we probably would not encourage it, but my explanation was somewhat lame as I haven't thought it through so completely so as to have a succinct answer, really, even though if I did, I doubt no matter how convincing it was to me, it would not begin to touch the deep-seated cultural traditions of our current godless society's influence on my fellow Christians." In the same conversation, an older Christian encouraged younger ones toward public education over home education in the case of special needs children. I walked away dumbfounded. How quickly, how easily we turn to cultural wisdom to solve our deepest problems over the word of God. I am just as guilty as she is. It's grievous and tragic to imagine all that God could do if we would just cry out to him, seek him, love him, and ask him for wisdom. But we don't. Why go to God when the government has a ready, easy, available option? Sometimes I get into arguments trying to convince people of the rightness or wrongness of things. People need to repent. Melancholy. I guess it boils down to the sad fact that I don't trust God to do that inner spiritual work in others, and I take the burden for their spiritual health upon myself. I know I need to do my part, but I would be so much more joy-filled and hope-filled if I could truly know and believe that God would fulfill all His plans for my children and our family. I'm afraid I will end up hindering God by not doing my part or by neglecting something. Matthew Arnold writes, Thou waitest for the spark from heaven, and we, light half-believers of our casual creeds, who never deeply felt nor clearly willed, whose insight never has borne fruit in deeds, whose vague resolves never have been fulfilled, for whom each year we see breeds new beginnings, disappointments new, who hesitate and falter life away, and lost tomorrow the ground won today. Ah! Do we not, wanderer, await it too? God, I do not want anyone I love to live the kind of life portrayed in that poem. By your power and grace, spare us from that. That is the best we can do on our own, though, so please empower us by your Holy Spirit and work your life into ours. Amen. Spiritualizer We had a conversation with a couple last night concerning our decision to throw away all of our Lord of the Rings paraphernalia. They did not approve. Oswald Chambers writes, When we are young in grace, we go where we want to go. But a time comes when Jesus says, And another shall gird thee. Our will and our wish are not asked for. 
This stage of spiritual experience brings us into fellowship with the Spirit of Jesus, for it is written large over his life that even Christ pleased not himself. There is a distinct experience when we cease to say, Lord, show me thy will, and the realization begins to dawn that we are God's will, and he can do with us what he likes. I am not my own. I belong to Christ. If he asks me to stop eating bread, I will. If he asks me to stop growing roses, I will. I don't need to rationalize his directives in my life, and I'd rather hang out with brothers and sisters who radically follow God and obey his word than lukewarm, argumentative, compromising, pill-popping brothers and sisters who live joyless, apathetic lives of devotion to the flesh. And I don't want to be that kind of casual Christian either. Dear God, light a fire in my life. Change me. Transform me into a visionary woman. Pour out your supernatural, powerful grace in my spirit and life so I can live a life empowered by you, your presence, and your word. My throat is killing me right now, but I will obey you today in... (laughs) I'm sorry. I haven't read this. For a long time. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. <laughs> I am out of character right now. <laughs> you guys, these are literal. <laughs> when I'm reading to you, I put in actual excerpts from my journals, okay? <laughs> so this is really what I believed in what I wrote. But <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me go back. <laughs> this is the grand finale. My throat is killing me right now, but I will obey you today in loving and patiently serving and training my seven children in spite of my physical infirmities. Your grace is sufficient for me. Onward. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. 1 Corinthians 1.27 and that's the end of my little sneak peek into part two. So sorry, I fell apart there at the very end. So anyway, this book is going to hopefully come out next year. And if you are interested in joining me in the work that I've done, not only on myself, but the work that I have done with thousands of Christian women, come and check out my program. You'd go to Join Flying Free dot com to get all of the details, read reviews, and find out how you can be part of it. It's only $29 a month. And yet the transformation that you will experience, if any of this at all is resonating with you, I'd love to show you something different, a different way of living your life. That is so much more less confusing and so much more life-giving. Go to joinflyingfree.com for more information. And also, I do already have a book out. It's called Is It Me? Making Sense of Your Confusing Marriage. And that's available on Amazon. And I will give you a free chapter, the first chapter of that book free and the first chapter of the companion workbook, which is also available on amazon.com. If you go to my website and get on the mailing list, my website is flyingfreenow.com. So go to join Flying Free if you want information on the program. Go to flyingfreenow.com if you want to get on my mailing list and get that very first chapter of my book. And you can go to Amazon to get my book and the companion workbook. Okay, that's all I have for you today. Next week, I'm going to give you a sneak peek into part three. And the week after that, I'm going to give you a sneak peek into part four. Hey, beautiful butterfly. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked this episode, be sure to subscribe and then consider leaving a rating and review so others can find us. To connect with me and get a free chapter of my book, head over to flyingfreenow.com. And until next time, fly free. Fly free.